If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X dot com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's podcast. And I want to say sorry for not being here for a little while. I've had a lot of things going on, got really, really busy, um, but we're back. And on today's podcast, we're going to be finishing up our talk about human lice. The last time we met, we looked at head and body lice. And today we're going to tackle pubic lice, or crabs, on the show. Joining me, as always, is parasitologist and author, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome back. Hi, glad to be here. Um, now, pubic lice are different than the head and body lice in many respects, including the genera of the ectoparasite. Um, Rosemary, what are pubic lice? Pubic lice are like the head and body lice that we discussed. They are ectoparasites. They live on the outside of the body. And like the other species of lice, they don't really live close to the to the body or on the skin directly, but they like things a little cooler. So they like to live on the hairs, and of course, hairs in the genital region, as their name suggests. But like you said, they are different from the head and body lice in many ways. They look quite different, for one thing. They're also called crab lice. That's their common name, and it's no accident because they actually do look like little crabs. They're uh, excuse me, <coughs> their body shape is more square. They almost look to me like a little armored tank rather than having an insect-like shape to their body. And they have a wicked-looking claw, which looks like a crab's pincer on the end of each of their six legs. So they do uh, resemble crabs in many ways. They also have a different uh, genus name, the rather unspellable and unpronounceable theorists. <laughs> pubis rather than pediculus, which is the genus name for the head and body lice. Now, how common are pubic lice? Well, they occur in between 2 to 10 percent of the population, depending on the region. Probably about 2 percent of the population in the United States. And they're thought to have been around for at least 10,000 years. So they're, they're old friends or old enemies, if you like. Sure. Now, you mentioned that they're found in the pubic region. Um, can you talk, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Is this a sexually transmitted infection? And are there other hairs that they can be found on? Yes, exactly. It is a sexually transmitted infection and often correlates or appears at the same time as other sexually transmitted infections. They, pubic lice, like a coarser hair and hairs that are perhaps a little further apart than they tend to be on our heads. So they will, they are also sometimes found on coarser hairs and more sparse hairs on other parts of the body. So perhaps on the, the legs, in the armpits, and even sometimes in the eyelashes and eyebrows. Okay, Rosemary, um, you mentioned that they appear as crabs. Um, now, are there different forms like with the head and body lice. That's right. There are the three life cycle stages again. So you have the adults, males and females, who mate, and the females lay eggs, which they cement onto the shaft of the hair. And these little eggs, they look like almost like little cocoons. They're cemented onto the hair, as I said, and they're very, very firmly attached. And at one end, they have a little operculum or a little trap door, which will open to let the larval stage of the louse out. Now, the larval stage is very tiny, but it looks like an adult. So you have those three, the adults, the eggs, and the larvae. Now, other than sexual contact, are there other ways to get pubic lice? 
there's a lot of discussion about this, and certainly close contact with somebody could result in passing pubic lice along. However, they tend to move very, very slowly and they die quickly within one or two days if they are shed. They tend to stay clinging on to hair, so if a pubic hair falls off, the louse will remain attached to that hair. It's not going to move around very much, so it's not all that easy, I think, to catch them without actually having that intimate contact with somebody else. But it does, it does happen. Now, what are the signs and symptoms that somebody with pubic lice would recognize? Typically, it's itching. They do visit the body to feed, and they feed on blood, so they bite. So they cause some irritation and itching. And the other likely way you might notice is that you just might see them, although they are very tiny. And um, concerning the diagnosis and treatment of pubic lice, is it similar to the head and body lice? It is. Diagnosis depends on finding the insects attached to the hairs, or the nits, of course, if you happen to see them. And the treatment is various types of insecticides, including permethrin, pyrethrin. Usually they recommend that you treat once and then treat again about nine days later because the initial treatment won't kill a recently laid egg. So there might be recently hatched larvae after about nine days. They are developing some resistance to these sort of more uh, routine treatments, so sometimes we have to turn to stronger things, uh, insecticides like malathion and lindane, although they all have some measure of side effects that one wants to avoid and often are not recommended for small children. So it is a matter of using enough insecticide to kill the insects without harming the host. Now, how about uh, disease transmission? Um, are the pubic lice known to transmit any type of infections? They're not. They're not known to transmit anything themselves. However, there is a recommendation that if you find them in an adult, you should check for other sexually transmitted infections because they do kind of tend to travel together. Okay, so the topic today is pubic crabs. And there has got to be a great story <laughs> concerning this topic. <laughs> well, people are understandably a little reluctant to tell their pubic life stories. But there are three kind of interesting things that I came across. One was a story which was actually related to me by a fellow who had been a crew member on a ship. He had contracted a case of pubic lice and swore up and down that he had done nothing to deserve them. But he felt that he had contracted them by being in the bottom bunk and that the person in the bunk above him had pubic lice and that they basically fell on him while he was sleeping. <laughs> so, of course, I have only his word for it that he didn't do anything else to, to deserve them. But I suppose that's a believable way that you could pick up pubic lice without even knowing you were in danger. Also, a paper that I read a number of years ago whereby somebody took a head louse a body louse and a pubic louse and placed them on somebody's stomach and waited to see whether they knew where to go. And in fact, they all did head in the right direction. So pubic lice seem to know where home is. And interestingly enough, there is some scientific literature out there wondering if pubic lice are going, are going to become extinct because it's the fashion now to remove, remove pubic hair. So a lot of people aren't really offering them a comfortable place to live, and we may actually be wiping them out. Interesting point. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm sure the first story you, you mentioned, uh, their significant other bought that. <laughs> well, I didn't ask that question. <laughs> yeah. Well, those are some really good stories, Rosemary. And again, I wanted to thank you for your time and your vast expertise. Thank you, ma'am. Always my pleasure. Thank you.